By the turn of 1943, Adolf Hitler's fortunes had completely reversed. Two years earlier, the Führer had been the master of Europe. Poland had refused to negotiate and had been eviscerated in weeks. The French refused to give up the fight, so they, too, were laid low in weeks once the Western offensive began. Norway and Yugoslavia had both been dragged into the fray by the Allies. The former was dispatched in a matter of weeks, the latter in a matter of days. Greece, too, had to be invaded and occupied due to Hitler's own allies' incompetence. There was no one left on the continent to stop Adolf Hitler, except for his ideological rival, the Soviet Union. The Soviets were evidently preparing to make their move. Churchill was clinging to Stalin as one of his last two hopes, the other being Roosevelt. In 1941, both of these hopes became reality. The Soviets prepared for a grand offensive into Europe, and Hitler made his preemptive move. The Red Army was crushed, but not defeated. Roosevelt, meanwhile, finally got his much-awaited chance to join the war and took it. There had been an undeclared war anyway for months now, so Hitler felt it prudent to just declare war on the US officially. In 1942, everything hung in the balance. The world was now essentially at war with Germany and her allies. Speed would be her only hope. The Americans wouldn't be ready yet, and the Soviets would still be licking their wounds from the previous year. This gamble failed. The Soviets had essentially infinite reserves, the Caucasus didn't hold, and Stalingrad was now encircled. On a personal level, Hitler's health declined along with his military. Things were not looking good. Africa, too, was about to fall. Mussolini appeared to be on the verge of throwing in the towel. If 1942 was important, 1943 was vital. This would be Germany's last chance. Perhaps it was already too late, but regardless, they had to try. It was now or never. A couple things before we begin. First of all, this video is part of a series on the life of Adolf Hitler. You can easily watch this video on its own, but if you'd like to start from the start, then a link to the complete series will be in the description, or you can find it front and centre on my channel homepage. Secondly, a quick disclaimer. This is a video about Adolf Hitler, who is of course controversial, no matter what. I urge you to not ever think this video, however. It is a work of history, not politics. Please be normal. Thank you. Lastly, a huge thank you to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who make these videos possible. Without their kind support, I wouldn't be able to do this for a living, and I cannot thank them enough. So if you'd like to support the channel, join our Discord, or our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please do consider signing up in one of the links in the description. Even the $2 tier helps immensely. Thank you. Hitler spent the turn of the new year sat alone with Martin Bormann in his bunker until 4am, and this state of affairs was pretty much how things went from here on out. Bormann had a near complete monopoly on Hitler, the Führer only really saw Bormann, Keitel, and Hans Lammers. As time passed, the more isolated the Führer became, and the more Bormann's power grew. Many have suggested that it was actually Bormann who now ran the Reich, whilst Hitler ran the war. This is quite correct. Matters on the home front were now but a distant memory to Hitler. Goebbels, in fact, was clamouring to be given the title Führer of the Home Front, as he was more the face of Germany back home now, not Hitler. Hitler himself absolutely dedicated himself to the war effort. The U-boat war, panzer, and aircraft production and the like. He barely slept, and he needed sedatives to do so. Scenario after scenario ran through his head as he laid there, unable to drift off. He was under more stress than perhaps any other man in history, bar one. Despite his increasing isolation, he did become more open to the advice of the general staff throughout early 1943. Hitler had insisted on not giving up any ground, and as a result, he was proven wrong. Stalingrad was encircled, and masses of men and equipment had been lost. Now, the retreats would be arranged in a more orderly fashion in order to inflict maximum pain on the enemy. Jim and morale wasn't completely broken. At this point, they could still blame the lack of oil, the weather, or their allies. They still held their heads somewhat high, and were capable of great military feats. In the face of overwhelming Soviet numerical supremacy, however, this would be a hard task. Back home, though, morale was shaking, and the security services reported as much. For the first time since Hitler came to power, there were audible mutterings of popular discontent. In the field, though, a semi-miracle had come off. A hasty retreat from the Caucasus had been issued. By the end of January, in just one month, this had been completed. At a loss of just 226 lives, the entire army group, 700,000 men, had retreated in good order with their heavy equipment in appalling conditions. Hitler hadn't given up on Stalingrad. He assembled his divisions from the Caucasus to be ready to go over to the offensive, and he planned to call over the three most powerful SS divisions, ready for a strike towards the encircled city in mid-February when the weather improved. Paulus and the Sixth Army just had to hold on. Indeed, Paulus's spirits were raised by these assurances from the Führer. As for the ongoing airlift, Goering was doing his best. 480 transport planes were dedicated purely to the airlift, and more were on their way. 
This wasn't even taking into account the escorts of the bombers. Privately, though, Goering knew they simply did not have the means. He was destroying his Luftwaffe for a very small chance of success. Meanwhile, letters came back from the airlift giving ominous signs. The men didn't trust in Paulus or the other commanders of the Sixth Army. A letter was even shown from a relative of Colonel von Bülow, Hitler's Luftwaffe adjutant, to this effect. Hitler began to look on his generals with increasing suspicion. He didn't look well upon Admiral Raider, either. Raider didn't see Hitler nearly as much as the other gaggle that clung to the Führer like spear, and he was about to pay for it. There was a mix-up with an attack on a British convoy on its way to northern Russia, and all hell broke loose. Speer had fallen out with Raider, as Raider refused to give control of naval armament to Speer's munitions ministry. As a result, he bitched and bitched to the Führer, so did Goering, and Raider was called in on the 6th of January and berated for 90 minutes straight. Raider resigned, and for his replacement, submitted the names of Admiral Rolf Karls, and reluctantly, his rival, Karl Dernitz. The latter got the job, but Raider left him with a single piece of advice. Do not trust Speer. On the front, things quickly got worse. On the 12th of January, the Russians attacked the weakly held Hungarian positions, and within days, 30,000 of their small force was dead. It was a national disaster for Horthy's Hungary, of cataclysmic proportions. Hitler's measures to fill the breach came too late. By now, there was 500 German tanks on the entire Eastern Front. The Russians had 5,000. Things looked dire. On the 17th, he and Speer launched the Adolf Hitler tank program. Hitler decided that all naval construction on anything above a destroyer should cease, and the manpower should be transferred to Speer for his tanks. In Stalingrad, too, things were bad. On the 19th, Paulus radioed in, quote, Mein Führer, your orders on the supply of my army are not being obeyed, end quote. The men could not hold on much longer, and indeed, neither could the troops outside the pocket, yet Hitler genuinely believed he could relieve them with the best of his SS. To hold on, Goering suggested that Paulus should simply let the Russian civilians and injured German soldiers starve and die. Quote, One can't burden oneself with wounded men beyond hope of recovery. They must be left to lapse into the hereafter. End quote. The generals from inside the city were just as critical of the Luftwaffe as vice versa. General Hube, who had recently been flown out in the airlift, said to Hitler, quote, The Luftwaffe airlift has failed. Why don't you kill off some of your Luftwaffe generals? End quote. Regardless of the growing mutual contempt between the men inside and outside of the pocket, Paulus radioed that he would fight on, quote, Your orders are being executed. Long live Germany. End quote. Even on the 30th of January, Paulus was radioing in defiantly, knowing that he was doomed in reality. Quote, on the anniversary of your assumption of power, the Sig Farmy sends greetings to the Fuhrer. The swastika still flutters over Stalingrad. May our struggles stand as an example to generations as yet unborn, never to surrender, no matter how desperate the odds. Then Germany will be victorious. Heil, mein Führer, end quote. Hitler broadcasted his reply to the nation. It ended, quote, In this fight, we shall have the Almighty on our side. We shall not shy from shedding our own blood, because one day a new land will blossom from the sacrifices of the fallen, and our Teutonic state, our German nation, shall emerge victorious, end quote. Hitler duly promoted General Paulus to field marshal. Paulus, however, knew full well what this meant. He wanted Paulus to kill himself, rather than surrender. At 7.35am on the 31st, Sixth Army headquarters responded to Hitler's proclamation. Quote, In our bunker, we listened to the Fuhrer's proclamation and saluted the national anthem for perhaps the last time. The Russians are at the door. We are destroying... End quote. The radio went dead. Early the next day, the Führer was given the news that Paulus, as well as 11 German and 5 Romanian generals, had surrendered. Hitler was livid. He raged, quote, The others stick together, form a phalanx, and keep the last bullet for themselves. Imagine, even a woman with an ounce of pride in her will lock herself in and put a bullet in her brain just because she has heard a few insulting words. Here is a man who can look on while 50 or 60,000 of his troops are dying and defending themselves with courage to the end. How can he give himself up to the Bolsheviks? End quote. The job wasn't done, however. The Soviets were still surging forwards. Hitler declared in February, quote, I won't be able to sleep again without sedatives until the breach is plugged, end quote. Two years later, he would complain to an army doctor, quote, I have to relax and speak about something else. Otherwise, I keep seeing the staff maps in the dark and my brain goes grinding on and it takes me hours on end to drop off, end quote. One of his newly brought in stenographers from December had already suffered a nervous breakdown. It's no wonder Hitler was aging so quickly. By now, he looked like a shadow of his former self from 1939, before the war began. Despite Hitler's stress, the rout continued, and by late February, Kursk, Belgorod, Krasnodar, Demyansk, Rostov, and Kharkov had all been recaptured. By now, Hitler was considering abandoning the Donetsk Basin too. 
In regards to the basin, he said, quote, I shall have to think it over, but one thing I can say now, if I do, there will be no further possibility of bringing the war in the East to an offensive conclusion. Let's make no mistake about that, end quote. Hitler knew the Eastern Front was essentially doomed, yet he still refused to negotiate. Ribbentrop desperately asked him to put out feelers to Stalin, yet the Fuhrer kept refusing. Hitler insisted, quote, first, we must win a major military victory, then we can see, end quote. He also refused to accept the help of the population in the East at Rosenberg's behest too. At the time, there was 130,000 Eastern troops, and there was Russian generals offering to lead them against Stalin. In a way, they would rekindle the civil war all over again. Most of the Soviet population, or at least a large proportion, would have sympathized with such a cause. Yet Hitler refused on exactly these grounds. He said that this would just be rekindling a Russian nationalism that would probably be a menace to Germany in the future. Rosenberg, the most renowned anti-Christian of the party, became somewhat of a champion of the Eastern population and their religious rights. Rosenberg read Hitler a memorandum in February that suggested that private property and enterprise should be reinstated in the East, religious freedom should be introduced, and that legions should be raised from the occupied ethnic groups. Most importantly, he stated that reasonable political proclamations on their own futures should be issued for them. These people wanted to fight and die for Hitler's cause. They should at least be given their independence back, or at least some of it, as a result. Himmler, of all people, backed this cause of Rosenberg's, especially when it came to the Baltic populations, whom he classified as Germanic. This proposal was parred off, much like Ribbentrop's had been. Hitler said that he would revisit the topic after the, quote, coming spring offensive, end quote. Hitler even seemed to resent the men wishing to fight for him. Of General Vlasov, who wanted to lead a Russian army of liberation, he said, quote, what a swine Vlasov must be. He owes everything to Stalin. It was Stalin who made a general out of him. Now he bites the hand that fed him, end quote. Hitler, even now, seemed to hold an ever-increasing respect for Stalin and his iron will. As for defeating Stalin, however, he seemed to have no answers. He wouldn't accept peace, and he wouldn't accept the help from the locals. He had no answers. Hitler was relying on a production miracle from Speer, as well as sheer will alone. On the 7th of February, Hitler explained the recent disaster to his Gauleiters, whom he invited to his headquarters. Herbert Back wrote a summary to his wife. Quote, Sunday at the Führer's, the Führer spoke. First words were, what you are witnessing is a catastrophe of unheard of magnitude. The Russians broke through. The Romanians gave up. The Hungarians didn't even put up a fight. For five days, German troops from the rear held the front in a thin line across the breakthrough locations. We've lost four armies in and around Stalingrad. Compares our situation with Colin and Kunusdorf. Said that if Frederick had had weapons like ours, they'd never have called him the Great, because then his seven years war would have been over in two months. The Führer again praised Speer. The Führer also said, if the German people fails, then it does not deserve that we fight for its future. Then we can write it off with equanimity. Not the right attitude of mind, end quote. Around the same time, Hitler also met with his generals. He agreed to withdraw from the eastern Donetsk region. He also agreed to withdraw from the 300 mile long line around Ryzhev and Vyazma. A far shorter line would be set up instead. The troops that had been freed up, however, were to be ready for an offensive in the spring, Hitler said. As for the home front, Hitler was overjoyed with how Goebbels had handled the Stalingrad propaganda. Goebbels suggested that total war be declared, and Hitler approved the suggestion as he was told it was what the people wanted. As for the people who didn't want such things, they were cracked down upon. The White Rose group was caught handing out leaflets at a Munich university, calling for Hitler's overthrow. For this crime, they were tried by the people's court and put to death. Hitler spoke of this to his generals privately later. Quote, Perhaps there are those who say it is incomprehensible that the people's court acts so ruthlessly. A man who just distributed leaflets or another, a university professor, and two students who distributed leaflets, are also executed. But if the professor and students responsible had been at the front, they might be just as dead now. Who knows? It's a risk every soldier takes all the time." End quote. In mid-February, the Führer headed south to General Manstein's headquarters in Ukraine. Speer was working miracles there, and the production was going through the roof. Yet all that would be pointless if Manstein couldn't hold. Hitler came down to ensure he held personally. Field Marshal Richthofen recalled in his diary, quote, There were cordons everywhere. Everybody that I asked in the streets where Army Group HQ was smiled scornfully and said, You won't get near it. The Fuhrer's there. Found the Fuhrer in midst of big war conference. I reported to him. Much beating around the bush. No real opinions. Mutual tension. An atmosphere you could cut with a knife. Fuhrer then withdrew to his private quarters without reaching any decisions. Fuhrer, very pleasant to me. Placid. Clear thinking. The question is, has he the necessary implements and ability to convert his clear thinking into orders, end quote. Soon enough, a counter-offensive was planned, and Hitler proclaims to his troops, shortly before, quote, Soldiers of Army Group South, 
airmen of the 4th Air Force, the outcome of a crucial battle depends on you. A thousand kilometers away from the Reich's frontiers, the fate of Germany's present and future is in the balance. The entire German homeland has been mobilized. Everybody down to the last man and woman is being called to serve your battle's needs. Our youth are manning the anti-aircraft defenses around Germany's cities and workplaces. More and more divisions are on their way. Weapons unique and hitherto unknown are on the way to your front. This is why I have flown to you, to exhaust every means of alleviating your defensive battle and to convert it into ultimate victory. If every one of you will help, we shall once again succeed with the Almighty's aid." End quote. Russian tanks were on their way, however, far too close for comfort, and Hitler had to quickly head off afterwards. The Führer took off for his Ukrainian headquarters, with the gunfire from Russian tanks audible in the distance. The Führer need not have worried. Manstein's men were victorious, and the Soviets were sent packing with an 8 to 1 casualty ratio in the Germans' favour. Whilst this was going on, however, Hitler got word that British saboteurs had blown up the heavy water plant in Norway and disappeared into the abyss. Atomic weapons could not be constructed without heavy water, according to the scientists of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and Speer. A few days later, Hitler was informed that to repair the heavy water production would take two entire years. Hitler remarked that the war would be long over by then. It was a bitter blow. On the 21st of February 1943, Heinz Guderian met Hitler for the first time since December 1941. The Führer was now a totally different man. Guderian recalled, quote, His left hand trembled, his back was bent, his gaze was fixed, his eyes protruded but lacked their former lustre, his cheeks were flecked with red, he easily lost his composure and was prone to angry outbursts and ill-considered decisions in consequence." End quote. Hitler's health was indeed terrible by now. He had brain inflammation, splitting headaches on one side, a trembling arm and a leg which dragged when he walked. Day in, day out, Hitler sat in his stuffy headquarters, going over events in his head again and again, endlessly worrying and crushing himself mentally with stress. He didn't exercise and was effectively in a coma of depression. He was indeed a completely new man. He grew cold, too. He tried to wipe the memory of the sixth army of Stalingrad. A new army of the same name was created, and any letters from the prisoners in Soviet captivity to their families were destroyed. To combat his extreme depressive moods, Dr. Morell actually injected him every other day with prostaglandin hormones, aka bull seminal vesicles and prostate. Almost every single day the doctor would be the first to see Hitler each morning. Hitler had a very low opinion of his allies now after several years of war, too. The Italians especially, Hitler viewed as completely inept. Recently, rather symbolically, an Italian column in the East had chucked a grenade at a passing panzer general. The dislike was mutual. Mussolini offered up another 700,000 men, but was rejected. Hitler reasoned that there was no point in equipping them with weapons, that they would just surrender immediately, when the weapons could be given to Germans who wouldn't surrender. He said the Italians weren't even suitable for defensive duties. Hitler still held a little bit of respect for the Romanians and their leader, Antonescu. The Hungarians and the Italians, however, were politely asked to leave the Eastern Front. In the West, however, Hitler needed allies. The British and the Americans were currently massing troops on the border of Spanish Morocco, and it appeared as if they were about to invade Portugal, and then the Spanish mainland too. Hitler finally relented to Franco's demands and promised to supply him with the weapons he required. Supposedly, Franco signed the treaty at this time. In return for a supply of modern weapons, the Spanish would join the Axis the second the British or American troops set foot in Portugal, Spain, or any of Spain's overseas possessions. Hitler's Iberian front was now seemingly secure. In the Balkans, there was other trouble. The Italians were simply ignoring German requests and just giving up masses of territory to Tito's communist partisans. The vitally important Bauxite mines of Mostar were just abandoned. The monarchist Serbian partisans were still being armed by the Italians. Hitler put pressure on Mussolini to halt this, and he indeed made a directive to this effect that the Serbians should be disarmed. The request was simply ignored by the Italian army. In late February, Ribbentrop was sent to Rome with a strongly worded letter, in which it was shown clearly that the Serbian monarchists were working for the Brits. The Italians, obviously, already knew this. They were supporting them anyway. When Ribbentrop arrived, he was given excuse after excuse. Hitler's patience then finally ended. He had spent years appeasing the Italians, but now he was almost at the end of his wits. An operation codenamed Black was drawn up for May, in which the Serbian monarchists, the Czechniks, would be crushed. The conference record states, quote, On account of the intimate relations between the Czechnik commanders and the Italian authorities, the Führer attaches particular importance to camouflaging our object and all the preparations, end quote. The Tunisian front was meanwhile described as a pack of cards by Rommel. 
The field marshal was conveniently sick whenever he was needed and was constantly losing faith. He was a broken man. He reported on his dreary outlook on things in Africa to Hitler, whom was sick of Rommel's attitude by now. Rommel said Tunisia needed to be abandoned. Hitler said, quote, This is a complete contradiction of his earlier contention. End quote. Hitler refused the withdrawal, but remarked, quote, This is the end. They might just as well be brought back. End quote. Rommel, despite his totally depressed outlook on things, did try his best with an offensive. Captured Italian officers, however, had supposedly betrayed Rommel's plans. They knew where he would be coming. As a result, Hitler didn't take things out on Rommel. The truth was, however, that the British had deciphered Rommel's signals. The Italian officer's story had been deliberately planted by the British Secret Service in a genius act of deviousness. On the 8th of March, Hitler recalled Rommel from North Africa to protect his reputation from the impending collapse. He reported to Mussolini, quote, For the time being, I have given the field marshal leave of absence to restore his health. This is urgently necessary, both in the judgment of the doctors and on the evidence of my own eyes. I must ask you at all costs to keep Rommel's absence on leave absolutely secret. Whatever posterity may judge of Field Marshal Rommel, to his troops, and particularly to the German soldiers, he was beloved in every command he held. He was always dreaded as an opponent by his enemies." End quote. Whilst all this was going on, Germany's major cities, including Berlin and Nuremberg, were being bombed to pieces. On the 1st of March, Berlin was hit with firebombs, and 35,000 people were left homeless, and 700 were killed. Göring's Luftwaffe was impotent to retaliate. In fact, Göring was off in Italy on a shopping trip at the time. Hitler remarked angrily, quote, When does the Reich Marshal get back? Things can't go on like this. We will never wear down the British like this. End quote. Hitler demanded that the air war against Britain be stepped up, and he hired and fired generals to this effect. Colonel Dietrich Peltz was appointed, and was effectively directly responsible to Hitler alone instead of the usual incompetence in the Luftwaffe. Meanwhile in the East, Hitler was pretty happy with events in Ukraine. Further north, a crafty retreat had been staged west of Moscow. The Soviets, confused, followed up. They found themselves tangled in well-prepared minefields and booby traps. Anything of value had been destroyed during the retreat. Their casualties were huge at no loss to the Germans. As they advanced further, they moved into well-prepared defensive positions. Here, the Russians were slaughtered too. The weather, however, was now turning to its typical sludge. As for the infamous Russian reserves issue, it appeared as if Hitler was at last maybe correct. The Soviets were indeed now finally drafting their 17-year-olds. The reserves might just well be coming to an end after all. Whilst back out east, Hitler made plans with his generals for Operation Citadel, a combined attack on the enemy salient at Kursk. Soon enough though, Hitler's doctor was demanding that he head to the Obersalzburg for some rest as he was being troubled by his recurring stomach spasms. Hitler headed off whilst the sludgy weather in the east still prevented him missing anything. Here, too, he would be closer to the Mediterranean, which appeared to be ready to implode. Whilst in Germany, his train took him off to inspect the new Gustav guns and the new gigantic Ferdinand tank. Hitler was deeply impressed. By now, his confidence appeared to be returning in general. Of the Russian armies in the east, he suggested that they were armies in name only and were severely depleted, ready to be smashed. After taking Eva Braun on board, the train eventually reached the Obersalzburg in late March. Here, though, his health did not improve. Almost immediately, he called his doctor. Morel wrote in his diary, quote, Complained of violent headache and a throbbing head. Temporal artery badly swollen, looking generally tired and languid, end quote. Before his meeting with Mussolini at the Berghof, King Boris of Bulgaria made a discreet appearance. The visit was so unknown that one of Hitler's secretaries accidentally walked in, munching an apple and holding a pair of tennis rackets. Hitler consoled her afterwards, quote, Don't worry yourself, even kings are only human, end quote. On the 7th of April, Mussolini arrived at Salzburg station. Irving recounts their meeting, quote, The Italians were housed at Klesheim, an enchanting Baroque chateau near Salzburg had been lavishly restored, and here a short series of what Zietzler contemptuously dubbed gala war conferences were held for Mussolini's benefit. Hitler did what he could to inspire Mussolini with the coming campaigns in the East, but the two dictators were moved by different purposes. Mussolini still wanted an armistice with Stalin to enable the Axis to throw all its might against Britain and the United States, and he handed to Hitler a memorandum on the possible negotiations. Given the Allies' poor showing over the Russian convoys and a second front, he said, Stalin had good cause to be disaffected. The Duce believed that Spain would voluntarily join the Axis. To Hitler, all this was disappointingly naive. If fascism in Italy was not to be overthrown, so he advised Mussolini, they must hold on to Tunis at all costs. This meant that the Italian navy must throw every fast cruiser and destroyer it had into the supply operations for Tunisia. The Duce asked for more oil for the ships, and Hitler agreed to supply it, end quote. Each evening, back at the Berghof, Eva Braun would host movie nights in the basement bowling alley. Hitler, however, refused, quote, 
In wartime, with the people called upon to make such sacrifices, I cannot watch movies. Besides, I must save my eyesight for reading maps and dispatches." End quote. Each night, too, Hitler refused to go to sleep until the last enemy bomber left German airspace. In March alone, 8,000 tons of bombs had hit Germany. In April, other nations weren't spared too. On the 4th of April, 228 French civilians were killed by American air raids on Paris. On the same night, 221 Italian civilians died in Naples from the same cause. On the 5th, the Americans hit the Flemish port of Antwerp. 2,130 civilians died. Hitler was unable to respond in kind, and seethed with the urge to take revenge. He saw hope in Speer's blueprints for a huge missile silo on the Channel coast, from which Britain could be bombarded. He ordered the project, immediately hurried along. He also said whilst there, quote, The moment the war is over, I'm going to hang my uniform on a nail, retire here, and let somebody else take over the government. As an old man, I shall write my memoirs, surrounded by clever, intellectual people. I never want to see another officer, end quote. Another significant move in handing over power came around this time too. Hitler signed off on a document making Bormann his official secretary, who had the right to quote, communicate the Führer's decisions and opinions to the Reich ministers and other departments and agencies, end quote. Bormann was powerful before, now he was even more so. Hitler only saw the non-military personnel that Bormann chose. Bormann essentially had a near monopoly on access to Hitler. Only Speer had any other real privilege with the Führer. In spring 1943, the Axis was on the verge of falling apart. Hitler knew that the Hungarians and Romanians had emissaries in neutral countries who were sounding out the Allies for prospects of peace. Finland, too, was trying to get out of the war. Sweden, on the other hand, was looking for a way into it on the Allied side. Hitler instructed his envoy in Stockholm to push for Swedish neutrality. If that didn't work, however, plans were quickly drawn up for a lightning invasion. On the 12th of April at the Berghof, Hitler confronted Antonescu with the wiretaps, clearly showing that Romanian ministers were disloyal and conversing with the enemy. Antonescu made a display of indignation. Hitler trusted him, and perhaps rightly so. Hitler had always had a soft spot for Antonescu, and the general did genuinely try his best for Romania. When the Axis armies were crushed near Stalingrad, it was he who pushed hard to create a Romanian army, essentially from scratch. Four days later, Admiral Horfi came for the same treatment. Hitler could read Horfi like a book, and knew how slippery he could be. Indeed, Horfi's memoirs after the war would be one of the biggest pile of lies in history. When presented with clear evidence of the double dealing of Hungarian Prime Minister Calais, Horfi simply denied the allegations. Hitler didn't buy it. He instead warned the aging regent, quote, We are all in the same boat. If anybody jumps ship now, he drowns, end quote. Immense pressure was also put on Horfi to put the Hungarian Jews in camps. Hitler said that they were rumour mongers, purveyors of defeatism, saboteurs, and allied agents. Horfi protested, but Ribbentrop told him that they should simply be kept apart from society, as in Slovakia, where they had been put in remote camps. The Kachin massacre had just been discovered, and Goebbels chose to make this Soviet massacre a Jewish issue in his propaganda, as the Soviet commissars were overwhelmingly Jewish. It was in this same vein that Hitler warned Horfi what would happen if the Soviets were to win. He stated that the entire European intelligentsia would be killed in this manner by the Jewish commissars if Horfi were to not deal with his Jews now and continue with his defeatism. Elsewhere in the East, there was an internal battle raging over the future of the Soviet non-Jewish population. Eric Koch, Reich Commissar in Ukraine, was behaving essentially like a thug. The Ukrainians were brutalised, and he lived a lavish lifestyle, whilst the Germans back home went without, and the Ukrainians starved. At Christmas 1942, he had ordered a special plane to collect 200 pounds of caviar. Rosenberg, minister for the occupied Eastern Territories, was absolutely and utterly against this, and he launched a crusade against Koch. Rosenberg believed that the occupied peoples could be a vital asset in the conquest of the Soviet Union, and indeed, it made perfect sense. They should be treated well and given a high degree of autonomy, or essential independence, if the Germans were to win the war. Rosenberg was supported by Ribbentrop, Zietzler, and Goebbels. Koch was supported by the morally bankrupt Bormann, and by extension, the Führer. On the 19th of May, Hitler brought Ribbentrop and Koch face to face. The result was a mess, and showed how brutal Hitler had become over the war years. Hitler judged that both men were right, but that Koch was more right. Rosenberg claimed that Koch's policies simply created more and more partisans, which Himmler simply waved off despite it being obviously correct. Rosenberg then spoke of Koch's executions in Ukraine, to which Hitler replied, quote, how many of our compatriots are losing their lives in air raids here at home?" End quote. Hitler then continued on to state that foreigners were not to be employed as advisers. Quote, if they work against their country, they are devoid of character. 
If they work for it, they are useless as advisors to us, end quote. In the end, it varied by region. In the Baltic states, Rosenberg had far more success, and the peoples there were wholeheartedly with the Germans, especially in Latvia and Estonia. These two contingents would be the biggest in the foreign SS. Down south, Kosh continued to rule with an iron fist, with disastrous effects. Indeed, the Ukrainian SS would be an absolute disaster. A few weeks later, Hitler met with Keitel and Zietzler in a heated session on the role of General Vlasov and his Russian Liberation Army. Here, too, Hitler was just as dismissive and untrusting. Vlasov was to be used as a propaganda tool, nothing more. No concrete decisions were to be made regarding the occupied peoples until after the war, and Hitler wanted his hands free when that time came. The issue was, by refusing this outpouring of help from the anti-Soviet millions, he was making winning the war a lot harder. The other issue Hitler discussed with Zietzler and Keitel was Operation Citadel. The operation near Kursk was hyped up to ridiculous proportions. Hitler said that a modest victory in Russia would stop the other Axis nations rush for the exit, and would also inspire neutrals. It would also stabilise the front, which would allow him to fix any upcoming Mediterranean nightmare which seemed to be imminent. Hitler was so confident of victory at Kursk that plans were already drawn up for the use of slave labour from the inevitable thousands of captured Russians there. As the date approached, however, ominous signs began to appear. The generals wanted constant delays, and the Russians seemed to be incredibly well entrenched judging by the aerial photographs. The attack was meant to begin on the 5th of May, but gradually, these days of delays turned into months of delays. Elsewhere, the Italian navy refused to leave port, and the defeat in Tunisia was imminent. Hitler dispatched General Varlamont to Rome to put pressure on the timid Italian navy, who was neither attacking the enemy nor helping supply the armies. Hitler tasked Varlamont to say, quote, The only moral act is to fight and win this war. What is immoral is to lose and then scuttle your ships without having fought, end quote. The Italians didn't listen and stayed in port. Days later, the British broke through in Tunisia. There were mixed opinions regarding Italy's current position. Varlamont believed that Mussolini's health was improving and that he was still firmly at the helm. Hitler disagreed. He said, quote, The Duce and the Fascist Party are resolved to stand by Germany through thick and thin, end quote. He then added, quote, A section of the officer corps, more at the top, fewer, lower down, is inclined to make peace already. Certain influential circles are capable of treachery, end quote. On the 6th of May, Hitler headed to Berlin. Victor Lutz, Rome's replacement as head of the SA nine years earlier, had just died in a car crash, and Hitler wanted to be there for his friend's lavish funeral. Afterwards, Hitler gave a speech to the Gauleiters on the meaning of the war. As Hitler left, he had Mussolini on his mind. In 1938, Hitler had famously gushed after the Anschluss, quote, Please tell Mussolini, I will never forget this. Never, never, never. Whatever happens, I will never forget. Whatever may happen. If he should ever need any help or be in any danger, he can be convinced that I shall stick to him. Whatever may happen, even if the whole world be against him, end quote. This was a promise the Fuhrer intended to keep. Despite the constant disappointments from Mussolini, Hitler did genuinely love him and considered him as a great friend whose destiny was tied together with his. Hitler didn't care at all for the Italians at large, but he did care for his friend. On the 9th, Rommel flew into Berlin and reported to Hitler. He was being tasked to control the German forces in Italy if things went downhill. He was to work in tandem with Mussolini to secure his regime, no matter what happened. Rommel wrote in his diary, quote, Afterward, I attended the war conference. No special job as yet. Field Marshal Keitel hinted at my utilisation in Italy with the Duce if things should turn sticky there, end quote. The next day, he wrote, quote, I stressed to both the Führer and Goebbels the meagre fighting quality of the Italians and their reluctance to fight, end quote. At one of these war conferences, an adjutant had broke the news that an Allied officer had been found floating off the Spanish coast with an envelope full of letters from the British War Office. The invasion plans were inside, which stated that one would be in the Peloponnese and the other would be in the Western Mediterranean. A false invasion of Sicily and the Dodecanese would serve as diversions. The Germans fell for the contents, hook, line and sinker. The Allies pulled off a masterclass. The letter was a fake and had deliberately been planted on the body and cast off to sea with the intention of the Germans finding it. Hitler, however, was one of the few who didn't buy it. Quote, Christian, couldn't this be a corpse they have deliberately played into our hands? End quote. At the time, however, there was no way of knowing, and Hitler had to believe it was real. Preparations were carried out for the false targets, not the real ones. The invasion, indeed, seemed like it would come soon. In mid-May, Tunisia fell. The last radio message went, quote, Ammunition spent. Arms and equipment destroyed. The Africa Corps has fought till it can fight no more, as ordered. End quote. 150,000 Italians were taken into British and American captivity, alongside 100,000 of Germany's finest troops. It was a nightmare. There was worse news as well. The British had upped their anti-submarine warfare game. Over 15 U-boats were being sunk a month. Grand Admiral Dernitz told the Führer, quote, 
We are also coming up to our worst U-boat crisis, since the enemy has new detecting gear, which can make submarine warfare impossible for the first time." End quote. Dernitz had also been talking to the Italians, and told them that they needed every ship, big and small, to pump troops and stores into Sardinia, Sicily and Corsica. If not, all three would be lost. Mussolini half-heartedly agreed, but his will was clearly gone. As for Hitler, his insomnia returned as it always did before, during, and for a time, after big events. Something was clearly about to happen in Italy. The British were, in fact, already publicly boasting that once Sicily was captured, then two million tons of shipping would be released, which currently had to go around the Cape. The Germans took this for a fake, like the letter on the body had said. On the 15th of May, Hitler spoke to his generals at length. Captain Wolf Junger took notes, quote, the enemy's victory in Africa has not only opened up the east-west passage through the Mediterranean for him, but released 18 to 20 divisions and considerable air and naval forces. They will also exploit the new situation for a political offensive, designed to use bluster and blandishments to persuade Germany's weak allies to defect. Quite apart from the military position, this is particularly dangerous in Italy and Hungary. Bulgaria and Romania can be regarded as secure. In Italy, we can only rely on the Duce. There are strong fears that he may be got rid of or neutralised in some way. The royal family, all leading members of the officer corps, the clergy, the Jews, and broad sectors of the civil service are hostile or negative towards us. The Duce is now marshalling his fascist guard about him, but the real power is in the hands of others. Moreover, he is uncertain of himself in military affairs and has to rely on his hostile or incompetent generals, as is evident from the incomprehensible reply, at least as coming from the Duce, turning down or evading the Fuhrer's offer of troops. In the present situation, a neutral Italy would not be bad at all, but it could not be neutral now. It would defect voluntarily or under pressure to the enemy camp. Italy in enemy hands is the second front in Europe we must avoid at all costs. It would lay open the western front of the Balkans too. Our main purpose now must be to prevent a second front in Europe. Europe must be defended in its outfield. We cannot allow a second front to emerge at the Reich's frontiers. It is for this objective that we may have to make sacrifices elsewhere. It is good that we have not yet attacked in the east and still have forces available there, because the decision has been taken to act as soon as a crisis breaks out in Italy. To this end, of the 18 mobile divisions available in the east, 8 armoured and 4 infantry divisions will have to be rushed to Italy to get a firm grip on her and defend her against the Anglo-Americans. No resistance of note is expected from the Italians. Collaboration of the fascist political forces is hoped for. At the same time, Hungary will be occupied. The consequences on Eastern Front will be defensive evacuation of the Oral Bend, acceptance of risk to the Donetsk region. If worse comes to worst, even withdrawal in the north to the Luga line, Zietzler demanded that the bridgehead on the Kaban should be given up, but the Fuhrer did not express an opinion on that. Zietzler was instructed to work out a timetable for the troop movements. The next one or two weeks are crucial. Every week is vital to us, because after about eight weeks, the newly activated Stalingrad divisions in the west will become operational, which would obviate the need to raid the eastern front for divisions. Thus, the main points of the Fuhrer's remarks, end quote. Meanwhile, Ribbentrop was begging Hitler to allow the publishing of the Africa Corps War Diaries to counter British propaganda, which was making fun of the Germans' humiliating defeat in Africa. Hitler refused, quote, We have to be clear that we have suffered a painful defeat in Africa. If you have taken a knock, you mustn't try and talk your way out of it or pretty things up. You will soon end up like the Italians, who make a veritable saga of every defeat they suffer until the whole world laughs at them. There is only one thing to do at times like this. Hold your tongue and prepare to counterattack. Once the counterattack is delivered, all talk of any inefficiency in German soldiers vanishes. Stalingrad is an example. The stories that the German division's morale was collapsing stopped the moment we struck back hard at the Russians again at Kharkov." End quote. As for Italy, Rommel had a skeleton staff prepared, and it was to be kept top secret. Rommel's greatest fear, however, was if he would get into Italy at all. The Italians were building fortifications along the frontier with Germany at that very moment, and if they were manned by the Italians so the Allies could enter the country, it could be a bloodbath. The preparations continued, and information continued to flood in from wiretaps and Abwehr agents. It was clear, Italy was going to defect. It was only a matter of time. On a more personal level, in mid-May, Hitler underwent an electrocardiogram, which revealed no improvement in his progressive coronary sclerosis affecting his heart vessels. General Antonescu recommended him a Viennese dietitian, Marlene von Exner. Hitler got on incredibly well with the Austrian, and she reminded him of his old Vienna days. Soon enough, she was sharing a table with Hitler and the other ladies from his headquarters staff. She found her job as Hitler's dietitian with his vegetarian diet to be an absolute nightmare, however. Another guest who was meant to arrive at the Burkhoff to join them was Mussolini, but Il Duce sent his regards. He couldn't make it. He most likely felt that he wasn't able to leave Italy, even for a few hours, with how tense things were there now. In June, Hitler was still at the Burkhoff. 
On one occasion, his outlook on the war was clearly revealed. Borman brought him a 76-page script for a speech from Dr. Goebbels that he wished to deliver. Hitler saw the line, when victory is ours, and edited it to, after this struggle is over. Evidently, Hitler no longer believed in a conquering victory, but rather a negotiated one, if any. The naval war, too, was getting worse. Dönitz had had to order the U-boat fleet back home in fears that it would be eviscerated. In one day alone on the 8th of May, five boats had been sunk in a single convoy battle. The U-boats would now be restricted until October, when the new destroyer buster homing torpedoes came into service. Hitler's June was spent mostly at the Berghof, terrified of launching Operation Citadel in case the Italians staged their imminent betrayal when his back was turned. By the time Citadel actually came about, Hitler didn't even let the OKV proclaim the operation publicly, so he could deny its existence if it failed. He also had the ever-growing partisan war to worry about. Hans Frank took his complaints to Hitler regarding his domain, the Polish general government. The SS had been simply terrorising and intimidating the locals however they saw fit, regardless of Frank's strict desire for them not to do so. Himmler was also brutally re-Germanising the ex-German areas. German peasants were literally being shoved in against their will, whilst the Polish inhabitants were carted off east into Frank's domain. Frank would complain that these brutal policies were just giving more reasons to the occupied peoples to join the partisan war. Hitler, however, explicitly stated that no blame could be attached to Himmler for this. It was the Kosh fiasco all over again. Hitler had essentially let his dogs off the chain in the East, and there were no longer limits. Hitler simply did not care anymore. The years of war had rendered him more and more brutal by the month. Human life to him at this stage meant very little. By 1945, this would have tragic consequences for the German people. Meanwhile, these same people were being bombed to smithereens. In the town of Wuppertal, 3,000 civilians were killed by British bombers in half an hour on the evening of the 24th of June. Hitler was livid with Goering, and by now, all faith had effectively been lost with the field marshal. Half his time was spent off on shopping trips, whilst no measures were introduced to defend the German people from their almost nightly British terror raids. Hitler decided to meet with the aircraft manufacturers behind Goering's back to get the truth of the Luftwaffe's failures. On the 29th of June, however, Hitler didn't have to linger anymore, and headed to the east in preparation for Citadel. There was reason to be hopeful. Stalin was clearly worried about the upcoming offensive, in Sweden, a German envoy reported that a Soviet diplomat, quote, wants to meet with a gentleman from the German Foreign Service with whom he is acquainted, end quote. On the 1st of July, too, a Soviet magazine attacked the West's collective guilt theory about Germany and openly suggested that Germany could keep Poland and the Sudeten territories if peace were arranged. If Citadel went well, Hitler might just be able to make Stalin throw in the towel and manage to keep some of his gains. Just prior to the launching of the operation, Hitler talked to the commanders involved, General Friesner recorded, quote, Our situation, the blame for our misfortunes, must be laid squarely on our allies. The Italians let us down completely. If, as the Fuhrer repeatedly demanded, they had made timely use of their fleet to escort and transport their troops to Africa, Africa would not have been lost. Now their ships are being smashed in their harbours. Comparison with World War I, where we too conserved our fleet too long until it was too late. Italians fail on the Eastern Front, in Greece, etc., Hungary, likewise. Romania, unreliable. The Marshal's brother, Prime Minister Mihai Antonescu, is a devious character. Finland at the end of her tether. Internal troubles with social democrats, fostered and fed by Sweden. What's at stake? Germany needs the conquered territory, or she will not exist for long. She must win hegemony over Europe. Where we are, we stay. Soldiers must see this, otherwise they'll regard their sacrifices in vain. Balkans must not be lost, no matter what. Our most vital raw materials for war are there. The Italians have pulled out of Greece and have been replaced by Germans. Feel safer since then. Crete is firmly in our hands, thus we prevent enemy from getting air bases. Greater Germany and Europe must be defended far beyond our frontiers. So far we have managed this perfectly. German troops are now occupying the Isles of Rhodes, Sicily, Sardinia and Corsica. The Italians would have long surrendered without them, just as they did without fighting in Pantelleria. Eastern Front, we will yield nothing without a scrap. The Russians are biding their time. They are using their time replenishing for the winter. We must not allow that, or there'll be fresh crises this winter, so we've got to disrupt them." End quote. At one point, Hitler admitted the real reason for Citadel to his generals. It was, quote, "...to dispel the gloom of our allies and crush any silent hopes still stirring within our subjugated people's breasts." End quote. On the 5th of July, the operation began. The Russians, however, had been pre-warned thanks to Britain's code-breaking geniuses. This issue alone would perhaps decide the war from here on out. 
The Brits knew pretty much everything the Germans were going to do, and when. Within three days, there was 30,000 German casualties, 3,000 Soviet tanks had been brought in for the defence, and the biggest tank battle in history now ensued. By the 8th of July, 460 enemy tanks had been destroyed. On that day alone, Hoff's 4th Panzer Army had knocked out 195. The wolf's lair was completely overcome with optimism. Soon enough, however, things began to slow down. On the 9th, Hitler's nightmare came true. There was a large enemy invasion operation taking place in the Mediterranean. By late in the evening, it was clear that these ships were heading for Sicily. The main harbours were being bombarded, and enemy paratroopers were being dropped. The next morning, the invasion began in earnest. 300 enemy ships were involved. The early signs of Italian behaviour were somehow even worse than expected. Quote, On the afternoon of July 11th, there was not one Italian soldier left in Schmel's brigade area under any kind of command. Every single officer had abandoned his troops during the morning, and was heading for Catania on bicycles and motor transport. End quote. All across the island, the Italians were blowing up their guns, refusing to resist, or just outright handing themselves over to the Allies without a fight. By the 12th of July, there was 160,000 Allied troops on Sicily, as well as 600 tanks. On that same day, Stalin launched his counter-offensive. It was chaos. Hitler felt that this counter-offensive, though, was inevitable. The Soviets were facing famine and massive unrest. Intercepted Soviet mailbags revealed encouraging signs. In Citadel, too, Manstein alone had captured 24,000 prisoners and destroyed or captured 1,800 enemy tanks. The signs were positive, at least at this stage. Super weapons, too, appeared to be on the horizon. The Type 21 submarine, which was so fast that all the enemy's defensive tactics would be useless, was going to be ready by November 1944. An anti-shipping mine that was so ridiculously advanced had to be kept away from the Navy in case the Allies managed to capture it and use it in greater numbers. The rocket project was going well, too. Both Speer and Himmler came to him and confirmed this fact. By the time the year was out, they would be ready, or so they said. Everything was happening at once on the battlefield, yet Hitler held his nerve. The superweapons especially would give him hope until the very end. In Hitler's meeting with Himmler, other matters were discussed too. Churchill had torn up Chamberlain's guarantee of Poland, and the Poles were under no illusions about the fact that they were being thrown under the bus. General Stefan Rybecki, chief of the Polish underground army, had been captured. Himmler proposed that the Poles be turned against the Soviets. After all, the Soviets were always the Poles' bigger enemy. Hitler admitted that he had the same idea, but he'd decided against it. The Poles weren't to be trusted. Whilst Hitler continued to refuse help from those in the East that would offer it, he naively looked west. He told Himmler that he particularly wanted to raise a British legion to join the fight. He had said the same to Walter Huell in November 1942. Huell wrote in his diary, quote, He believes that countless patriotic Englishmen must be suffering under their present regime. They see the future danger of the Jews, and particularly the Bolsheviks taking over the empire. He considers it quite possible that given suitable treatment, a British legion could be raised to fight in British uniforms against Bolshevism. Such a legion would be more welcome to him than any of any other nationality." End quote. Hitler's trust was extremely misplaced. He refused to trust the extreme anti-communists in the East. He continued to hold on to his love of the British people. The issue was, the British people, until very recently, have always tended to be very trusting of their government, and by extension, vulnerable to propaganda. Finding a pro-Hitler Brit would be like finding a needle in a haystack. Indeed, the British Free Corps would be an absolute clown show when it was finally established. Meanwhile, back in the East, the fight had come to a standstill. The generals disagreed. Some wanted to push on, some wanted to call it off. Hitler chose the latter view. The battle was duly stopped as a stalemate. The Germans had lost 3,330 dead, yet the Soviets had lost 17,000 men and 34,000 prisoners. Stalin's counteroffensive seemed to be losing steam, too. It seemed as if stability on the Russian front was perhaps the new norm. The same could not be said for Sicily. It was a rout. The island was falling rapidly, and the generals and the king seemed almost ready to launch their long-awaited coup against Mussolini. General Ambrosio began to harass Hitler for impossible quantities of modern tanks and aircraft. This was the same tactic the Italians used when they wanted to avoid fighting the war in late August 1939, and again they'd used it during the war whenever they wanted to escape responsibility. It was clear they were looking for a pretext to defect, as the Germans obviously couldn't supply such quantities of equipment. Mussolini himself began to blame the Germans for the rout in Sicily, because they supposedly hadn't supplied the Italians with enough equipment. In Western Sicily, however, the Italians had been folded up like paper. In Eastern Sicily, though, the Germans were holding around Mount Etna. The excuse was a lie. The Italians just didn't have the will to fight. The Italian fleet, even now, was refusing to leave their harbours. Admiral Dönitz called up Hitler and told him that he was ready to take command of the Italian navy at once if the Führer so wished. By this point, it didn't seem like a crazy proposal. The Italians had proven to be useless allies, and Hitler had no qualms about treading on their sovereignty. 
A major had even been sent to Italy with oral instructions that the Germans were to take over the command of the battle and completely exclude the Italians. The Italian batteries in the Strait of Messina were to be taken from the Italians and manned by German crews. The contingency plans were brought up ready for a lightning strike against Italy and the Italian Balkans. There was no more time for sops to Mussolini or mistakes. Hitler now meant business. Italy had made her bed. Hitler showed Field Marshal Milch Mussolini's letter drafted by General Ambrosio, demanding more material on the 14th of July. Milch could barely contain himself, it was so ridiculous. The Germans had transferred absolutely vital air power from the Reich to Italy to defend the Italians. The German people were suffering horribly in the cities due to this. German civilians were being sacrificed in a way, so the Italians could have a chance. Somehow this still wasn't good enough, but there simply wasn't more to give. Milch came to the same conclusion as Hitler. The Italians were trying to bait as much German material into Italy, and also their elite crews, so that when the time came they could be quickly encircled and destroyed. In Sicily, Hitler appointed General Hube, the veteran of Stalingrad, to command all ground troops. As for overall command in Italy, Goering, who wasn't Rommel's biggest fan, managed to convince the Fuhrer to strip the Desert Fox of this honour on the grounds that he was, quote, hostile towards the Italians, end quote. Rommel was instead assigned to hold Greece. This assignment, however, only lasted a couple weeks. Events were moving fast. Before heading south on the 18th of July, Hitler was so overcome with stress about the imminent coup that he had to call his doctor. Morel wrote in his diary, quote, Fuhrer says he's had the most violent stomach pain since 3am and hasn't slept a wink. His abdomen is as taut as a board, full of gas, looking very pale and exceptionally jumpy, facing a vital conference with the Duce in Italy tomorrow. Diagnosis, spastic constipation caused by overwork over the last few days, three days with virtually no sleep, one conference after another and working far into the night. As he can't duck out of some important conferences and decisions before his departure at 3.30pm, no narcotics can be given to him. I can only give him an intravenous injection of one ampoule of Eupreverin, some gentle stomach massage, two E-flat pills, and three spoons of olive oil. Before leaving for the airfield, I give him an intramuscular Eucodal injection. He is looking very bad and feeling rather faint, end quote. He continued on regarding the flight, quote, During the actual flight, Hitler let off wind, which resulted in some improvement. Up at the Birkhoff, I gave him another body massage with more U-flat, followed by the Louisim I've been giving him repeatedly for some time, end quote. The next day, quote, his abdomen is supple, he has slept well, and let off a lot of wind, end quote. Effectively, Hitler was so riddled with stress about the Italy situation that his health was taking an embarrassing turn for the worst. At 7.30 the next day, the 19th of July, Hitler headed south to meet Mussolini at Treviso. Mussolini wrote down his account in his diary, quote, punctually at nine, the Fuhrer landed, he inspected the Guard of Honour, and we proceeded to the station. After about an hour, the train left us at a station outside Feltra. An automobile bore us onward to the villa selected for our meeting, the house of Senator Gargia, a veritable labyrinth of rooms and salons which is still a nightmare in my memory. We arrived there after an hour's drive in an open car under a scorching sun, during which I merely exchanged polite small talk with the Fuhrer. The actual meeting began at noon. The Fuhrer began the talking and continued for two hours. His words were taken down in shorthand, and the complete text of his speech is in foreign ministry files. Scarcely had he begun when my secretary came in with a telephone message from Rome. Since 11am, Rome has been under intense air bombardment. I informed the Fuhrer and the others. The news charged the atmosphere with tragedy. The atmosphere crowded in on us with each fresh telephone message reporting the exceptional length of the raid, the number of bombers employed and the severe damage, including the university and the church of San Lorenzo. When the Fuhrer had concluded his speech, a first confidential exchange of opinions took place between the two of us. He imparted two important facts to me. Firstly, the U-boat war was about to be resumed with other means, and secondly, at the end of August, the German Luftwaffe would begin reprisal attacks on London, raising it to the ground within a week. I replied that in anticipation of the reprisals this would provoke, Italy's air defences would have to be strengthened. I was then called away to receive fresh reports, whereupon it was time to return, only during the hour-long train journey could I make one thing plain to him, that Italy was now withstanding the weight of two empires, Britain and the United States, and there is a very real and growing danger of being crushed between them. The bombing of our cities damages not only our public's morale and powers of resistance, but also our main war production. I told him again that the campaign in Africa would have ended very differently had we been at least equal, if not superior to the enemy air force. I also warned that the nervous tension within my country is now at an extreme and dangerous pitch. He told me the Italian crisis was a leadership crisis, and hence a human one. He would send reinforcements for the Air Force and new divisions to defend the peninsula. He declared that the defence of Italy is also in Germany's highest interests. His choice of words was friendly at all times, and we parted on the best of terms. The Führer's aircraft took off soon afterwards, end quote. This would be Hitler's last ever visit to Italy. From now on, it would be a battlefield. 
Regardless, he left pleased with the outcome of the meeting, although Mussolini clearly seemed shaken and a shell of his former self. Before leaving, Mussolini had shouted to Hitler, quote, I just don't know why my generals are stationing such strong forces up here in the north, end quote. Mussolini was living in a naive world of his own. The troops were there ready to betray and attack Germany. That evening, Hitler was shown clear evidence by Himmler and Bormann that, quote, a coup d'etat is being planned to get rid of the Duce and install Marshal Badoglio to form a war cabinet, end quote. The report read, quote, Badoglio is known to be a leading Freemason in Italy. His aim is said to be to commence immediate peace talks the moment the Anglo-American troops have completed their occupation of Sicily, end quote. Shortly afterwards, German railroad officials informed the OKV that the Italians were stockpiling ammunition in the forts on the German borders. On the 24th, Hitler was informed that the Grand Council of Fascism was meeting that evening for the first time in years. Events were coming to a head, but midnight came and went without any word from Rome. Before he went to bed that night, however, a 1,000 bomber raid hit Hamburg. It was genocide. The next morning he was shown the photographs. Women torn to pieces on the floor, burned children in the arms of firefighters, corpses everywhere. The city was destroyed. Hitler had to harden his heart and focus on the task at hand in Italy, however, but inside it was destroying him. His people were being slaughtered. Later that day, on the 25th, word reached Hitler that Marshal Badoglio was asking to meet the German ambassador. Soon afterwards, the bombshell dropped. Mussolini had resigned, and the king had asked the marshal to take over. Hitler exclaimed to Keitel, quote, Badoglio has taken over, the blackest of our enemies, end quote. Hitler's initial reaction was to just send paratroopers to Rome, steamroll Italy, and strangle the baby in its crib, so to speak. As the days ticked by after the Badoglio coup, however, Hitler chose a more slow and steady approach. There were German troops in Sicily, and on the border between the two nations, yet there was 1,000 miles between the two. Caution was of the utmost importance, and throughout August, despite Badoglio's objections, German troops began to infiltrate the country, ready for the obvious betrayal. On the same day as the news about Badoglio broke, Rommel had already been recalled from Greece so he could handle the Italian crisis. Meanwhile, the most important men in Germany flooded to the wolf's lair to plan the next steps with Hitler. Himmler, Guderian, Goebbels, Goering, Speer, Ribbentrop and Dernitz were all in attendance. If the Italians believed switching sides would be easy, they had another thing coming. What made Hitler's blood boil most of all was the disappearance of his friend Benito Mussolini. The two were bound by destiny, and now he was gone. The Germans didn't even know if he was alive. Hitler spoke with extreme harshness about the Italians now. Quote, We can be clear on one score. Traitors that they are, they will of course proclaim their intention of continuing the fight. Of course, but it will be a betrayal. We shall be playing the same game, leading them on until we suddenly drop like lightning on the whole bag of them, and round up the entire gang. End quote. On the 26th of July, Field Marshal Kesselring was given orders to stand by to seize Rome and prevent the escape of the Italian fleet. Other units were to be ready to surround the capital when the time came. Meanwhile, the task closest to Hitler's heart was already being hatched. Barely 24 hours had passed, and Himmler already had half a dozen Luftwaffe and army special agents at the Wolf's Lair as candidates to rescue Hitler's friend, the Duce. Otto Gunscher, Hitler's bodyguard, took them into the Führer's study. The Führer posed a question to them, quote, What do you think of the Italians? End quote. The last of them, a huge, scar-faced SS captain, blurted out, quote, What a question, mein Führer, and me, an Austrian, end quote. The next day, this man, Otto Scorzani, was on his way to Rome with General Kurt's student. There was a split about how the overall Italian operation should go. Dernitz and Jodl wanted to wait for the Italians to act first. Rommel wanted to wait and plan things out. Hitler wanted to pounce on Rome now. Goebbels agreed. Kesselring, meanwhile, believed the Italians wouldn't swap sides at all. He had met with Badoglio, and the Italian had explained that he had no plans to change sides. Badoglio did, however, say, quote, You see, Field Marshal, this is the problem that gives me sleepless nights. How to lead a defeated army onto victory, end quote. Hitler simply laughed at Kesselring for believing the Italian when this was brought up, as did pretty much everything else. Field Marshal Richthofen wrote in his diary, quote, Everybody very rude about Kesselring. I counterattack. Some of his dispatches are admittedly psychologically tactless, but by and large, objective and accurate. I identify myself with them. Rommel knows nothing, thank God, says nothing, and is just reveling in feelings of revenge against the Italians, whom he hates. Dernitz is moderate and sensible. Everybody else, especially Ribbentrop, just repeating whatever the Führer says, end quote. Richthofen then predicted that Badoglio would most likely send impossible demands for supplies as a pretext to deal with the enemy. Almost on cue, the demand arrived. Everyone suddenly began to agree more with Hitler's viewpoint of acting swiftly. 
Churchill, however, rescued the Germans from an over-eager blunder. In the House of Commons, the Prime Minister said that he would accept nothing less than unconditional surrender from the Italians, essentially admitting that the Italians were trying to get good terms from the British. He then said, quote, We should let the Italians, to use a homely phrase, stew in their own juice for a bit, end quote. By the 28th, Hitler had decided against a preemptive strike. He would let the Italians stew in their own juice, too. On the 29th, an intercepted conversation between Churchill and Roosevelt reached the Fuhrer, in which the two spoke openly about the, quote, imminent armistice with Italy, end quote. In the conversation, it was made obvious that the deal with the Italians would take time, as Churchill wanted to ensure the 60,000 British prisoners in the country didn't pass over to Hunland, as the PM called Germany. The entire time, Canaris of the Abwehr was feeding Hitler false reports, stating that Italy was not going to defect. Soon enough, he was unmasked as a traitor of gigantic proportions, Almost immediately, everyone began to sniff treason, and the plans pushed on regardless under the code word Axis. By this stage, too, Hitler knew that Mussolini was alive. His 60th birthday present, a 24-volume set of Nietzsche, had reached the dictator, and he had received an acknowledgement to this effect from Il Duce. Where he was, however, was not known. Whilst this planning went on, the air war continued. Night after night, bombs were dropped on German cities. In the last week of July, Hamburg was hit again and again and again. In one, a firestorm was deliberately created. Trees, houses, debris, and people were all sucked into the flames. Those sheltering in the concrete bunkers throughout the city were simply incinerated alive. All that was left of many of them was piles of fatty goo on the floor. 50,000 died in Hamburg alone that July, never mind the other cities. Speer gloomily predicted to Hitler that if this happened to six more cities, the war would be over. Following the Hamburg raid, Hitler ordered the evacuation of women and children from Berlin. Goebbels then arranged this, and one million civilians were quickly evacuated in anticipation of the raids to come. In August, the raids continued as expected. On one occasion, Berlin was used as bait, and instead, the Peenemund missile site was hit. 700 of Germany's best scientists and slave labourers were killed. Jeschenek, chief of the general staff for the Luftwaffe, killed himself in shame. Goering was nowhere to be seen to take the blame. Meanwhile, Hitler desperately tried to think of ways to provide for the homeless. He commanded Speer to provide materials to make new houses. Robert Ley said he could build 350,000 a year, but Hitler wanted more. Speer, however, said, quote, I will not provide the materials because I cannot, end quote. Hitler responded, quote, I need one million new homes and fast, each about 10 feet by 12. It is immaterial whether they are made of wood, concrete, or prefabricated slabs. I'm even thinking in terms of mud huts, or at worst, just holes in the ground simply covered by planks, the houses should be built singly in individual plots, around towns and villages, where possible scattered amongst the trees. We are forced to build as spartanly as possible, so there must be no distinction between them. The main thing is for these people to have a roof over their heads when winter comes, otherwise they will perish." End quote. As for retaliation, the missile program was stepped up, and Himmler imposed himself more and more upon it, offering up more slave labour and test sites for Speer to use. The German people would just have to hold on until they could retaliate, and in Hitler's mind, the Allied facade would soon fall apart. There was reason to believe that there would indeed be a break between the Soviets and the Anglo-Americans. The Germans would hold on to this belief right until the end in the bunker. Stalin had recently set up a puppet Polish government and a Free Germany Committee made up of Stalingrad generals and exiled communists. To anyone with any foresight, it was obvious that Stalin was planning on incorporating half of Europe into his empire as puppet states. Churchill, however, knew this, he just didn't care. Hitler would say on the topic, quote, I fully recognise that at present, a ruthless desire to destroy us is rampant in Britain and America, but the British have got it all quite wrong. They declared war to preserve the balance of power in Europe, but now Russia has awakened and turned into a state of the highest technical and material calibre. This means that the onslaught from the East can in the future only be met by a united Europe under German leadership. That is in Britain's interest too, end quote. This too would be a familiar theme. Hitler genuinely didn't hold on to any hatred of the Americans and the British, despite them massacring his people in firestorms by the tens of thousands. He felt they were misguided, and led by crooks like Churchill and Roosevelt, who in his eyes were simply just puppets for bloodthirsty Jews who wanted to destroy Germany. Back on the front, however, there was a war to fight until that day when the Anglo-Americans would somehow magically awaken and change sides. In Sicily, the Germans had held on, and fought an admirable defensive battle towards the strait. Meanwhile, Italian troops were stealthily being positioned in greater numbers near the German border. Hitler said, quote, These steps were obviously taken to satisfy the Anglo-American requirements that Italy must take positive action against Germany if she is to get better peace terms, end quote. This was the scene at the Wolf's Lair on the 11th of August, as written by Rommel, quote, 
Goering, Dönitz, Student and Himmler are at the midday conference, discussing Italy. The Führer agrees with my own views. Führer appears to intend sending me in quite soon. Like me, he doesn't believe in the honesty of the Italians. The Führer says the Italians are playing for time. Then, they will defect. The Führer evidently wants to adhere to his old plan of restoring fascism to power, as this is the only way to guarantee that Italy will unconditionally stand by us. He has sharp words of condemnation for the work of Mackensen, Rintelen, and Kesselring, as they, and particularly Kesselring, still totally misinterpret the Italian situation and blindly trust the new regime. Lunch with the Führer. I sit on his left. A very spirited discussion with the Führer, evidently delighted that I am there. Again and again, I find that he has complete confidence in me. Before supper, I confer with Yodel. His plan, based on our proposal, was for me to take command in Upper Italy. My new draft has me in command of all Italy, with two armies, whilst being myself under the Italians, the army group HQ near Rome, so as to exert influence over the Commando Supremo and the regime. After I refute his objections, Yodel agrees. Then, supper with the Fuhrer, and even in conference, he approves my proposal to fight a delaying action in Sicily, and to fall back on Italy, only when forced to do so, and meanwhile to establish four lines of resistance, the first from Consenza to Taranto, the second at Salerno, the third at Casino, and the fourth and ultimate line along the Apennines, end quote. Rommel was afterwards sent to confront the Italians in Bologna on the 15th of August. They were to present a plan for a joint defence of Italy and gauge the Italians' reaction. This would be their last chance. The Italians immediately blew their cover and presented a map in which the Italian divisions created a barrier across the peninsula, trapping the Germans in the south. The motive was obvious. Around the same time, there was a potentially connected event regarding King Boris of Bulgaria, a great friend of Hitler's and indeed a trusted ally. Irving explains at length, quote, one further episode illustrates Hitler's abysmal hatred of the Italian House of Savoy. He had invited King Boris of Bulgaria to the Wolf's Lair for an informal visit. They lunched together for three hours on August the 14th, and again the next day. In the intervals, Boris amused himself with his hobby, clambering around a locomotive's footplate. Hitler's staff had thoughtfully provided one with steam ready raised on a nearby siding. According to Franz von Sonnleitner, Boris at last agreed to allow his intact divisions to be used against the Russians. We were all very contented, wrote Sonnleitner, when Boris left. Hitler himself accompanied the king to Rastenberg airfield. Two weeks later, King Boris was struck down by a disease of mysterious suddenness. The German air attaché in Sofia provided immediate air transport for the king's German physician, Dr. Seitz. On August the 24th, Seitz reported, however, that the king was dying. He provisionally diagnosed a bladder disease, and Hitler sent the Reich's finest doctor, Professor Hans Eppinger, from Vienna to assist. Complications set in, and the famous neurologist Professor Maximilian de Crinis was flown in from Berlin on the 28th, but at 4.20pm the king died. The king's Italian wife, Giovanna, would not permit an autopsy, but Eppinger noticed that the royal corpse's lower extremities had turned black, a phenomenon he had only seen once before, after the Greek Prime Minister, Ionis Metaxas, had swallowed poison in January 1941. Upon the German doctor's return, Hitler instructed his Minister of Justice to discharge them from their oath of secrecy and to question them. They were unanimous that the cause of death was an exotic snake poison. It was the characteristic Balkan death, as Eppinger put it. Hitler was disconsolate at the loss of the stabilizing influence in Bulgaria. He ordered a powerful delegation to attend the state funeral. His instinct told him that the House of Savoy lay behind the murder. Was it not suspicious that Princess Mafalda, the king's sister-in-law and daughter of the King of Italy, wife of Philip of Hesse and blackest carrion in the Italian royal house, as Hitler luridly described her, had spent some weeks in Sofia quite recently? From the Forschungsamt, he learned that Prince Philip had recently dictated groups of ciphers over the telephone to Mafalda, employing some private code. To arrest him, however, would be to alarm the Italian monarchy too soon, so Hitler invited the prince to be his guest at headquarters, treated him with continued hospitality, and told his guards not to let him out again." End quote. There was issues in the north too. Hitler's staff movie cameraman, Lieutenant Volta Frenz, was visiting Hitler for his own birthday. He had just returned from a tour of the Atlantic Wall project, and he brought up the fact that there had been several guerrilla bomb incidents whilst he was in Denmark. Hitler ordered General Yodel to look into this. When the reports came back, they were shocking, and Hitler ordered Ribbentrop to issue an ultimatum to the Danish government, whom he had until now treated with the utmost leniency. The ultimatum requested that a state of emergency be declared, and the partisans be suppressed. As anticipated, the Danes refused. The Danish forces were then quickly disarmed, almost without a shot being fired. The king and crown prince were placed under house arrest, and the Danish navy was surrendered to Admiral Dönitz. All Jews were either deported from Denmark or managed to escape to neutral Sweden. Meanwhile, in Germany itself, Himmler's men were busy too. His Gestapo rounded up all German dissidents in a lightning strike as discontent had been bubbling due to events in Italy. 
Many began to believe if Hitler would depose and the Allies would guarantee them against Russia, and all would be okay. Most of the able-bodied who were arrested were put to the guillotine, as Himmler put it. There were more plotters too, including dismissed generals and ex-ministers. Himmler began to keep closer and closer tabs on them. In Bohemia, the protector, Karl Hermann Frank, was given new powers to crack down on any dissent too. Goering would accurately remark later, quote, It became increasingly clear that the Fuhrer was turning more and more to the exponents of brute force, end quote. Meanwhile in Italy, things were coming to a head. On the 17th of August, an Italian general forced a German unit at gunpoint to hand over American parachutists they had taken prisoner in northern Italy. The next day, Hitler issued a secret directive to his troops in the south, informing them of Italy's potential imminent defection. Mechanized divisions were sent off to the coastal area most in danger of invasion, between Salerno and Naples. The Italians, meanwhile, had seven divisions around Rome, and only one division to defend all of Apulia. In effect, seven times the troops were being dedicated to preempting the Germans, as opposed to the Allies in the heel of the boot. Elsewhere, Allied convoys had been spotted by agents passing through the Strait of Gibraltar, carrying 70,000 troops and their equipment. The Allied landings in tandem with the Italian surrender were clearly being prepared. On the 26th of August, a message came in from an agent in Rome, quote, Badoglio has asked Britain for an armistice, regardless of conditions. The British have promised a reply by Saturday, August the 28th, 1943, and want to send in a strong convoy meantime with the most up-to-date weapons to enable temporary resistance to be offered to German troops, end quote. On the 30th, the OKV issued a directive for Operation Axis, when the code word was issued, the Germans were to disarm the Italians, seize their weapons, and retreat northwards towards Rome. In the north, a fascist government was to be restored. On the retreat, the Germans were to burn and destroy, quote, as though on enemy soil, end quote. Corsica was to be held, too. On the 2nd of September, the Brits landed two divisions on the southernmost point of the Italian peninsula. There was little to no resistance. The decoded British message recorded, quote, 600 prisoners taken, including two colonels, no minefields, no Germans, civilians are friendly, end quote. Reports flooded back from Germany and Italy, stating that the Italians were loyal, yet Hitler refused to believe them. General Antonescu was visiting Hitler at the time, and the Fuhrer warned his friend to be on the lookout for poison when he returned home, so he wouldn't suffer the same fate as Tsar Boris. On the 4th of September, Hitler said the same thing to Rommel before the field marshal was due to meet the Italian king, quote, The Fuhrer has forbidden me to eat anything there, out of concern for my health, end quote. Hitler was now in the east, though. He had been forced back out here, as Stalin had exploited the Mediterranean chaos for making several attacks of his own, and they were working, all over the front. Hitler, for once, allowed his generals to make tactical retreats if it meant that the front would be shortened and less troops were needed. Soon enough, a far greater retreat would be needed as well. Kiev would fall on the 6th of November. A new strategy was proposed, but it was a bitter pill to swallow. A grand east wall would be constructed, all the way from Narva in the north down to the Kirsch Peninsula in the south. Hitler had to accept these suggestions from his army. Italy was the main priority right now, and it showed in Hitler's demeanour. The events in Italy were absolutely gnawing at him, and on the 7th he couldn't take it any longer, and suddenly departed back west to the Wolf's Lair, where he could keep a better eye on events. He had left Soviet soil for the last time. Hitler's timing was perfect. Soon enough the BBC announced Italy's unconditional surrender. Badoglio had finally played his hand. From Algiers, General Eisenhower broadcast a proclamation, quote, the armistice was signed by my representative and representatives of Marshal Badoglio and takes force immediately, end quote. The generals in Rome were immediately called up and the Italians there began to refute the Allied broadcast, claiming it was a wicked libel on the honour of Italy. These denials robbed Hitler of his ability to act immediately. Soon enough though, that same day, Ribbentrop learned that Badoglio had indeed confessed that Italy had surrendered. Finally, the Italians had played their hand fully. The German response was lightning fast, unlike anything else in history. The code word was telephone to the south. The Italian ships were urged by the British Admiral Cunningham to make a break for the nearest Allied haven. The German Admiralty commented, quote, The consequences of this vile act of treachery, unique in military history, will be very different from what Italy has hoped. The countryside will become a battlefield between the betrayed allies of yesterday and the ruthless conquerors of today, end quote. At 5am, Hitler went to bed to get whatever sleep he could. He and he alone had predicted the Italians' complete and utter treachery. The doubters had been discredited. The Italians were now going to pay a very heavy price. Operation Axis proceeded smoothly. Rome was quickly seized and Italians were being disarmed all over the country. Fighting broke out in the Aegean, Rhodes and Corfu, and an ultimatum was issued to all Italian troops to lay down their arms, otherwise their commanders would be shot as partisans. The Italians in the Balkans acted treacherously. 
They handed their arms over to the partisans more often than not, especially Tito's guerrillas in Dalmatia. Often the Italians were caught doing this, and their officers were simply shot before firing squads. The Italian troops themselves who had done this were deported east to act as slave labour for the German army. Everywhere, the Italians were acting with the utmost treachery. In Nice, a German officer was killed by an Italian hand grenade. The railroad garrison there was massacred in revenge. The Italian navy, too, had sailed out of port on a pretext on the 9th of September. Luftwaffe bombers managed to sink the Roma battleship and injured her sister ship, the Italia. Others got to allied ports. In the south, the Italians had directly told the Americans where the minefields were so they could avoid them. In Naples, an Italian naval lieutenant set the fuel dumps on fire. Badoglio, the king and their cronies meanwhile made a dash to the south to reach the enemy. All of this paled in comparison to the greatest betrayal of all, however, that struck Hitler to the very core. A message was intercepted which stated plainly that Badoglio had promised to hand Benito Mussolini over to the Allies. Hitler's heart bled for his friend when he got the news. On the 10th of September, Hitler made a broadcast of the German public regarding his dear friend, quote, Understandably, I am grieved by the sight of the unique injustice inflicted on this man and the degrading treatment meted out to him, whose only care these last 20 years and more has been for his people, as though he were a common criminal. I was, and I'm glad to call this great and loyal man my friend, end quote. The statement sounded more like an obituary. In Mussolini's absence, however, a national government was formed under Alessandro Pavolini, and any territory north of the Apennines was classed as German-occupied territory, with a military governor. South of this was the Operation Zone. Anything of value was to be stripped from the south and shipped north. On the 12th, Hitler met with his two frontier Gauleiters, Franz Hoffer from Tyrol and Friedrich Rainer from Corinthia. Two decrees were signed which handed over a large trunk of northern Italy to their administration. The future Germany, if they won the war, was now to stretch south, right up to the frontiers of Venetia. The Croatians were given their beloved Dalmatian coastline back, too. Whilst this was going on, however, Mussolini had been freed in a daring mountain rescue. The giant Scorzani had literally charged in and bowled over the little Italian guards. He shouted out to Mussolini, quote, Duce, the Fuhrer has sent me, you are free, end quote. Mussolini was overcome with emotion and couldn't stop smiling. He replied, quote, I knew my friend Adolf Hitler would not abandon me, end quote. Mussolini continued to profusely thank his saviours the entire way to the plane and then home. His family had been rescued in another daring raid at the same time as well. At 9.45pm, an SS general telephoned from Vienna whilst Hitler and Himmler were eating dinner to say that Scorzani had just arrived there with Mussolini. Hitler remarked, quote, That'll show the British that I never turn my back on a friend, that I'm a man of my word. They'll say, he's a friend indeed, end quote. After the news broke, Speer suggested that some of the harsh decrees on Italy should be cancelled, but Hitler refused and simply moved the date from the 12th to the 13th so it didn't appear as if Mussolini's rescue had changed his decisions regarding Italy's future. Regardless, Hitler was genuinely happy about the return of his friend. Two days later, he headed to the local airfield to greet him. When he got there, Il Duce appeared as shadow of his former self. He claimed that he was ill, and Hitler immediately feared the worst and felt that he'd been poisoned, but Dr. Morel had a look at him, and there was nothing wrong in the slightest. There was even more disappointing signs too. The Fuhrer expected Mussolini to be chomping at the bit to exact revenge on the traitors like Count Ciano and Dino Grandi, whom had betrayed him. Mussolini didn't seem to care. He was a broken man and just wanted to retire to the Italian countryside and be done with everything. A few days later, Edda Mussolini, Count Ciano's wife and Mussolini's daughter, was brought to Germany. She begged Hitler for enough Spanish currency to enable her to emigrate through Spain to South America with the treacherous Ciano. Hitler politely told her no. Ciano would remain in German hands. The Germans had also intercepted a letter from Edda to her father, which threatened that if Mussolini did not take her out of Italy, then she would, quote, cause the name of her father to be cursed throughout the world, end quote. Hitler and Goebbels paced around for hours that night, wondering what on earth Edda could possibly have to use against her father. She seemed to have a complete hold over him. Hitler kindly advised Mussolini to get his family's affairs in order. Meanwhile in the south, on the battlefield, the Americans were being absolutely brutalised by a German counterattack. Two Panzer armies and a Panzer Grenadier division had joined the fray on the 13th, and two American divisions were utterly routed. They failed to push the Allies back into the sea though due to intense Allied naval bombardments, and so Hitler's staff had to rejoice at the thrashing of the Americans, as opposed to their total ejection from the continent. In general, the Germans didn't think highly of the Americans. Yodel reported that they were nothing compared to Montgomery's seasoned British troops, and he said that except for American paratroopers, the rest, quote, never attack so long as a single gun is left firing from the German lines, end quote. Hitler himself didn't fear an American invasion in the slightest. He said, quote, no more invasions for them. They are much too cowardly for that. They only managed the one at Salerno because the Italians gave their blessing, end quote. The bungled invasion and the Italian defection had actually benefited the Germans materially, rather than hindered them too. 
Irving explains at length the shock the Germans found when they moved into the country. Quote, No longer did Germany have to feed Italy with coal, oil, and foodstuffs. By the end of September, the first 268,000 Italian prisoners had already been transported to the Reich. Operation Axis had also yielded a big haul of Italian weaponry. 449 tanks, 2,000 guns, and 500,000 rifles. The notes taken by one general staff officer attending the Führer conferences of September the 30th reflect Hitler's astonishment at the booty made by his troops in Italy. Goering reported that they had found hundreds of Italian fighter planes. How did these cripples manage it? burst out Hitler. The Italians and the Duce, responded Goering, have been deliberately doing the dirty on us for years. They simply squirreled away raw materials and aircraft. The Duce ought to be shot. Hitler, however, felt that it was the king and his generals who were to blame. As for their own strategy in southern Italy, he emphasised how vital it was to hold the enemy down there for as long as they could. We've got to win time, he said. The enemy are having a pretty thin time themselves. Their reserves of manpower and materials are subject to exactly the same limitations as our own, and sooner or later, they are bound to get fed up with it. From a certain time onward, the war can't be won by conquering the whole world, but by dragging out the fighting so long that the others get worn out. Addressing Goering directly, he exclaimed, Time, time, time. Afterward, the author of these notes jotted down his own personal impression of the first meeting with the Führer. He looked tired and unwell. He is markedly bowed. From time to time, his belief in the propriety of his actions and in ultimate victory did come through. He ought to get rid of his entire entourage, however, as a matter of utmost urgency, end quote. Meanwhile, there was positive signs back in the Reich. The Brits had tried to give Berlin the treatment that they had given Hamburg, but were rebuffed. The new freelance night fighter tactics introduced by Colonel Harjo Hermann were proving effective. Goebbels evacuation order, too, had saved thousands of lives in the cities. On a September the 1st raid, only 13 Berliners died, and in the final raid on the 3rd, 346 died, only one of which was a child. From now on, there was big painted arrows in every major city to tell people where to go in case of another firestorm. Meanwhile, the Allied bomber pilots were taking a beating in the air. Those that managed to survive being downed were lucky if they weren't immediately lynched by justifiably livid German civilians when they hit the floor. In October, the Americans, too, were brutalised. Hitler urged Goering and Garland to get their fighter squadrons on the home front better prepared, and they duly reaped their rewards. In three days of raids from the 7th to the 10th of October, the Americans lost 88 bombers and nearly 900 men. On the 14th, they tried to hit the Schweinfurt ball bearings factories. Here, 60 fighters were brought down, and 17 more were severely damaged. Bombing Germany was turning into a very risky proposition for Allied airmen. The mortality rates were horrific. On the 22nd of October, however, the city of Kassel was hit by a British firestorm terror raid, and 6,000 civilians were killed. In late October, Himmler showed Hitler a passage from a letter sent home by a young SS brigadier on the Eastern Front named Hermann Fagerlein. Inside was written, quote, If the others had not been there, I would so much have liked to tell the Führer how much his soldiers revere him and are devoted to him. Even if his orders sometimes seem merciless or cruel, when the order is, hold on to the last man, one feeling is supreme among the men fighting for their fatherland with rifles in their hand, that they have as their leader a man second to the Lord God alone, end quote. Fagerlein was selected a few days later by Hitler as his liaison officer to Himmler, and in June 1944, he would marry Eva Braun's sister. Also in October, on the 15th, Himmler's chief of foreign intelligence reported that the British trade chief in Stockholm, David McEvan, was offering to come to Germany for a conference on economic affairs, but really this was a peace feeler, although how serious this was is up for discussion. Hitler, however, thrust this aside. The war was too far gone now. There could only be winners and losers. This happened with Stalin too. One day, Hitler would tell Mussolini he planned to negotiate with Stalin. The next, he would change his mind. Ribbentrop was losing his mind trying to organise peace on either side, whilst the Führer was so unpredictable and decisive. Every single time the topic came up, it was a lost cause. Meanwhile in Italy, Rommel was being an eternal pessimist, despite incredible successes in the South. He was dismissed from his post in Italy, and would be given a new, as yet undecided appointment. Hitler would recall a year later, quote, In Italy too, he predicted our collapse as being just around the corner. It still has not yet occurred. Events have proved him completely wrong, and thoroughly justified my decision to leave Field Marshal Kesselring there. My view is that without optimism, you cannot be a military commander, end quote. On the 23rd of October in the East, the main attack began on the Sixth Army sector of the East Wall. It was a rout. Kleist and the other commanders lost their nerve, and Milletpol was quickly overrun, and a massive retreat began. In the North, another gap in the German lines appeared. Hitler frantically appealed to Marshal Antonescu to rush Romanian divisions up to plug the gap. Antonescu, meanwhile, advised retreating from Crimea before the troops there too were overrun. Hitler decided to ignore Antonescu's advice. Dönitz, Zietzler, Jodl and Göring all agreed with Hitler, as if that if Crimea were cut off, a seaborne evacuation could be staged. Four days later, Antonescu was right. Crimea was cut off. Irving describes the war at that time. Quote, 
The war conferences of October the 27th, 1943, vividly illustrated the complexities of fighting wars on many fronts with dwindling resources. Pitched battles were being fought with communist insurgents and guerrillas in the Balkans. At night, the skies of Europe were angry with bomber engines. Speer needed workers to clear the rubble, build factories, and operate machinery. Milch needed manpower for his new aircraft industry. Above all, Hitler needed fresh divisions to repair the breaches in the Eastern Front. In September, he had already had to lift the draft deferment, allowed to the sole surviving sons of families, end quote. Over the last few months of 1943, Hitler was often heard to say that if the Allies established a beachhead in Europe, the war would be lost. And indeed, it was an open secret that they were coming to France in 1944. If they weren't swept off the beach, then it would basically be over. In a directive on November the 3rd, Hitler said, quote, Now the danger in the East remains, but an even greater one is emerging in the West, the Anglo-American invasion. The sheer vastness of the Eastern spaces allows us to countenance even a major loss of territory if the worst comes to the worst without it striking fatally at Germany's vital arteries. Not so the West. I can therefore no longer tolerate the weakening of the West in favour of other theatres of war." End quote. There was also the danger the Allies might land elsewhere too. The chief problem was the Balkans. Tito now had a literal army at his disposal there, 100,000 strong. The Italian withdrawal, too, had left a void in places like Albania. A single German battalion now held the entire coastline there. If the Allies wanted to, they could land a single regiment and take over Albania within a couple of weeks. Hitler decided that a political realignment was necessary, given the circumstances. Feelers were sent out to Mihailovic. The Serbs were also tempted by the restoration of Montenegro, the removal of Goering's corrupt economic envoy, and favours for Prime Minister Milan Nedic, whom Hitler trusted and liked. The coast, however, was the most important part of the Balkans. On the 11th of November, a small German force landed on the island of Leros, which was held by 10,000 British and Italian troops. Within five days, the island was again in German hands after bloody fighting. Samos was taken on the 22nd, and the entire Dodecanese was now under German control. Despite this victory, Hitler hated dealing with the Balkans. He said at a war conference, quote, If the British said Germany's job would be to keep the Balkans in order, we'd be busy for the next 30 years, marching in and out and back again, banging their heads together and getting out again, end quote. Meanwhile, the Turks were under pressure to abandon their neutrality. This information came from an Albanian spy known as Cicero, who worked as a manservant for Sir Hugh Nakbal Hugeson. The Albanian was given a camera, skeleton keys, and a mountain of Turkish money. Whenever the ambassador went off for his hour-long baths and breakfasts, the Albanian would simply photograph all of the British papers and send them to Himmler's intelligence agents. Some of these documents reveal that the British were demanding the usage of Turkish air bases to support their situation in the Aegean. The Turkish foreign minister refused to discuss this demand, and indeed, they had steadfastly defended their independence against the Brits. In fact, the Turks were refusing partly on moral grounds, as the Brits had let it slip that they were going to give Eastern Europe to Stalin. After a meeting in Cairo, President Ainonu returned absolutely horrified and said that if he had ever seen that coming, then he wouldn't have even bothered to go for the meeting. Eden's strategy had even been intercepted by Cicero. One of his cables to his ambassador read, quote, To sum up, our object is to get Turkey into the war as early as possible, and in any case to maintain a threat to the Germans from the eastern end of the Mediterranean until Overlord is launched. We still have not given up the idea that our squadrons should fly on the 15th of February, end quote. The Turks, ever since learning of the fate of Eastern Europe, had become even more friendly to Germany. The Turkish foreign minister bluntly said to Franz von Papen, quote, We are at the most critical pass in our recent history, but since the Balkans are to be sacrificed to the Russians, we have no alternative but to keep playing our hand the way we are doing, in the hope that the German Eastern Front holds firm, end quote. The Turkish game plan was to keep giving the Brits impossible demands for joining the war, much as the Italians had always done to the Germans. Hitler knew the strategy well by now. He could most likely rely on the Turks to stay out of the fight. Other positive signs came from Turkey. Eden had told the British ambassador there they had a bad impression of the Russian army, and that it seemed to be, quote, at the end of its tether, end quote. Hitler clearly fought in the same vein. He said to his generals regarding the Red Army, quote, We must not think of it as some kind of medieval giant that gets stronger every time it topples to the ground. One day its strength must also fail, end quote. The reality was, however, that the Russians were advancing seemingly everywhere. Hitler was soon getting reports of defeatism spreading like cancer among the troops in the East. The censor's office got the same impression. The letters clearly displayed that the troops were no longer believing in victory. Goebbels wrote, quote, 
Where will it ever end? The Soviets have reserves of which we never dreamed, even in our most pessimistic estimates." End quote. Perhaps the Red Army was a medieval giant, after all. In mid-November, Hitler discussed with his advisers the possibility of recruiting more Latvian and Estonian troops to defend their homelands, as the battle was seen to be at their doorstep. Rosenberg plainly laid out that unless the Baltic nations were given assurances of autonomy, then they wouldn't spill blood for the Germans' cause. Rosenberg said that Hitler, quote, was inwardly opposed to making such far-reaching concessions in difficult times, end quote. In the end, though, the Latvians and the Estonians fought regardless, despite the lack of assurances. Anything was better to them than Soviet rule, which had tortured and killed so many of their family members just a few years prior. In the South, Crimea had become a sort of second Stalingrad for Hitler. If Crimea fell, then the Brits would be able to strengthen their hand with Turkey, and more importantly, if General Antonescu lost his army there, he could be overthrown. Constant debates raged at headquarters about what to do regarding the peninsula. Captain Heinz Arsmann, a regular participant in Hitler's war conferences, sums up Hitler's views at the end of the year, on the 29th of December. Quote, The questions occupying the Führer and Wehrmacht operations staff now are primarily these. 1. Is all the Anglo-American huffing and puffing about an invasion in the West, speeches, articles, new appointments and newspaper reports, really serious or just an immense bluff to dupe Germany and perhaps Russia too? Are they trying to lure units away from the Eastern Front, or prevent us from reinforcing that front at the crucial moment of the Soviet Winter Offensive? Is the invasion Ballyhoo a diversion for a major operation in the Balkans, either via Crete, Rhodes, and the Aegean, or via Turkey, or both? 3. Is the invasion planned not for the West, but perhaps in Denmark, Norway, after all? 4. Is Turkey as reliable as she seems, or has she perhaps already resigned herself to the passage of British troops and the use of her airfields? 5. Can we hold the Ukraine, which is vital for feeding the German people? Where can we still cut back on strength to hold the worst pressure points on the Eastern Front? Where is the first infallible clue as to their real invasion intentions? 6. Will the U-boat campaign with the new submarine types result in the desired successes? End quote. And so, Adolf Hitler and Germany ended the year in an even more precarious situation than the last. Perhaps the only shining light of the year was that the Italian problem was finally over and that the Germans were now in charge of their own destiny in the Mediterranean. Regardless, things didn't look hopeful at all. The people were beginning to lose faith, and so were the troops. And whilst you're fighting against almost the entire world, faith is perhaps the most important thing. Hitler would begin to rely more and more on his potential superweapons to save the day at the last moment, and in 1944, he was certainly going to need them. The year was surely not going to pass without a major Allied invasion. He just needed to know where and when. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did get to the end, then please do leave a like, it helps a lot. As always though, the biggest thank you of all goes to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who make these videos possible. It is by their help alone that I'm able to do these videos for a living, and I cannot thank them enough. So if you'd like to support the channel, join our Discord, or our Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please do consider clicking one of the links in the description. Even the $2 tier helps immensely. Thank you. Thank you to Lobster to you, Darwe Lolololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Friendly Brian, Mr Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, Ethan Win Stanley, Wunderwaffe, Mr Bloom, Gav D, Guys Longanese Hanno, J D, Green Rebel, Angus Roxborough, Rucksacker Too Heavy, Alexios Podcast Watcher, Citadel, Haste. Bojan M, Rick Me, Mr. Gaming, Cameron, Sludwig 1919, Gloomy, Troy Harser, Jagdkampf, Rowan, Swedish Chef, Honda, Mirko, David Byers, Max Anton, Gragas, Conqueror, Espen, Khan, Luca Marincic, Veritas Unleashed, Dereal G, Joel, Ghost 0128, Jack, Bobby Atkinson, John DeGrief, Ward, Crankless, Dramatic Equation, Russ Hale, Senator Armstrong, Lucas Drury, Mark Smith, Shameful Display, Sneed Seed and Feed, Bruno, Emma Magishmail, William S, Ozzy Mandias, Sword Dog, Ozzy Ones, Prada, Ozzy Zuma, Joe Ford, Jive Ginseng, Mr. Toad, Lay Agnew, Carolyn J, Alex D, Violently Normal, Brendan Stout, K Reich, Unlikely Balmer, Enclave, Welcome to Kali Yuga, The Old Vault, Justin F, Lane Perkins, King Fried Chicken, Rennie Malmgren, Gianni Rabati, Panzer Jim, Ahopa Ahola, Laurel, Hans, Chris, Jordan Troy, Jihad Gandalf, Aifel, Lucas Likes and Ring, The Hog Shotgun, Bjorn Richter, Grady Peters, Patrick Finn, Nemesis 88, Mike and Johnny's Secret Pod, Emil Flinch, Panzer Wagenleid, Rand Atlas 1902, 
Dustin Stratton, Tyler Yoshida, What Next, Heinz Haber, Pax Tibi Marse, Zuma Historian is the Best, Pat Mike, Genesee Vice, Ace Gunner, Martin Harkinson, John Sonkali, Scar, Chronic Military Collector, Jan Kalivoda, Herwig Holger, Toons Tierney, Gerald Lorenz, Devin Lay, Henry Ramdas Jr., Adam Croucher, Melvin Cade, Pooper, Uga Booga, Colin Maloney, Zan, North, Ibby, Avery Moller, Varangian Guard, Kirk Weaver, Heinrich Mueller, John Shelton, Surfer Dude, Dakota Rosson, Micah Holly, Edelman, Random Person 24, D, Gertz, No Name 325, Sinful Hero, Agent, Pragmatic Culture, W. Justin Walls, Mortales, Sebastian, It's Okay to Be a Nationalist, Inflection Point, Vet Exempt, Automat 762X39, Monsoir Mercier, Charlie Black, Will from Florida, History by Grayscale, Friendly Fash, Jonathan S. Marinsky, Demetrius Laquan Fauci, Christian, The Waller, Suma Klubiak, Jorgen 1997, Admiral Kempinski, Carl Jung, James Ferris, Anna Paula Gomez Coelho, Pavement to 86, Kurt Alinde, The Glorious Lion, Omega, Kirk Panzer, Final, Son of Tiamat, Luke, and Shifty Sheriff 2.